welcome to EWTN's Bookmark, and our author is Susan Tussoni, author of Praying with the Saints for the Holy Souls in Purgatory, and it's published by our Sunday Visitor, and welcome oh, to EWTN's to Bookmark, and welcome to our new site, I love Susan. it. It's nice to now, be in the you, library again. Now, how many books w would this be for you now uh, with this new book, Praying with the Saints for the Holy Souls in Purgatory? Number I mean, six. it seems like the theme is always the most part, the holy souls in purgatory, that's, right? That's my mission, um, Doug. I, in fact, um, I didn't know it was my mission. I didn't know I was going to be signed up for purgatory duty. Mm -hmm. But um, actually, if I can just share a little background, I I was um, hit by a cab, you know. And so you talk about that in the book, Yes, in right? the book. Right. And they people wanted to know the story, how it got involved. So yeah. I, I commented about that. And uh, uh, I learned that uh, the day that I was... Uh, injured was the day that a great aunt I had was also injured by a cab. But many years before, right? Yes, uh, 50 years to the day, actually. Right. And so um, after I learned about that, I, I was chatting with a priest because it was just too coincidental. And he said that um, sometimes a sacrifice, she died and mm -hmm. I survived. And he said, sometimes a sacrifice is made in the family for a greater cause. And he said, your mission is purgatory mm -hmm. because I had already started. And he said, uh, you know, that's you know, why you're here. Uh, so I, I've taken it even more seriously. So um, that's how I got involved. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. Now, it's interesting, too, because you, you, you talk about little Mary was the, the aunt who had died, right? The, yes, the, yes, uh, 10 years old. Right. right, so when she was little. Now, you also had an experience, too, which I thought was interesting, too, because you, you see people who get involved with these kinds of situations, and it's always interesting what the motivation is and what leads them. But you also had, you now, the leg that was healed, was that what was damaged in that Cab yes, accident? In, the, in the cab accident. I okay. was hit by a cab on the street, and what's interesting is I fell on the hood, and he hit me again, and it was that second hit that actually mm -hmm. saved me because it threw me uh, 50 feet. Mm -hmm. And um, about uh, 12, I wasn't allowed to travel. About 12 years later, I just had this desire to go on a Marian pilgrimage. Mm -hmm. My mother planted the seeds in our young hearts. I think of Mother Angelica. She had the holy reminders around the house. Right. She had the pilgrim. EWTN religious calendar. Yes, the holy reminders. reminders. We right. had the pilgrim virgin statue, mm -hmm. the rosary. We had the scripture was out. Mm -hmm. We had, um, you know, the uh, Last Supper. Hopefully, people are seeing those again in their homes. Oh yes. Oh, there's a there's a big rise on that. And right. thanks to you, um, they're available too. Mm -hmm. Uh, but she planted the seed in our young hearts, and uh, it never left me. I always wanted to go on a Marian pilgrimage, so um, I got permission to uh, to go and uh, came back and found that that damaged, injured mm -hmm. leg for 12 years. It was gone. Really? Yeah, okay. I, yeah. It shocked me because I didn't go on a pilgrimage for something. I went because of the mm -hmm. devotion I had to Our Lady, right. um, and uh, I have a bond with her, and I just wanted to right. go experience being with her and uh, and come back and try to maybe stay close to her. But you also seem to think that this whole mission with Purgatory comes from Our Lady as well. In a yes, sense, uh, you, right? it, that's when it started. It was right after that that someone gave me some material on Purgatory. At, I was Read just, me or rue it. Right, it's a, it was a little. Sounds booklet. a little sinister. It did to me. I I didn't even understand what what it meant. Uh -huh. uh, it was just handed to me, and uh, I uh, picked it up one night and just read through it. And I was just fascinated with the stories, and I was fascinated by the fact that they needed our help and that they were des in desperate need, and that no one could help them. And then coming from a business background. It was quid pro quo. I'll help you, you help me. Mm -hmm. And you make a lot of friends. And I thought I could use all the friends I could get. Mm -hmm. And I decided to start, uh, you know, asking folks, friends, families for mass stipends because that's. What is a mass stipend? People it's hear a that. Stipend, they not know. You can't buy a mass. Uh, there's no, you can't put a value on the mass, but it's a, it's a donation. It came um, in the eighth century. Pretty small donation. Too, uh, yes, usually. it could be any kind of donation. Yeah, Doesn't, right. There's no particular amount here. But it actually, what it does, it, it helps with the uh, ministries of the church. Mm -hmm. um, when I learned about mass stipends, because uh, I wanted to direct them in a, in a, you know, to a reputable place, and um, I decided the missions is the best place. Uh, and what the nun told me really struck me. Um, she said, you know what you get when you offer a mass stipend for whatever intention. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be the souls in purgatory. It could be you know, any kind of personal intention. She said, you know, with those stipends, you're able to um, put gas in the Jeep for the priest to go up to offer Mass. Sometimes those people only hear Mass right. once a year. She said, also it buys books for seminarians. Right. And she said, do you know what you get when you buy books for seminarians? And I said, what's that? And she said, a priest for 40 years. Mm -hmm. And I, I just 
said, oh, oh my gosh. Um, and that's when I decided, okay, right. I've got to help with this. Yeah, you also say, I learned too that many people around the world only attend mass once a year because the priest has no stipends to even purchase the bread and wine. Exactly, for, actually, for the for, Eucharist. For saying mass. One of the things that struck me, because you, you tie into here and you have Cardinal D.S. In, yes. in, the, in the front of the book and the preface talking about you know, the help for the missions and raising money for the missions. But I thought it was kind of interesting because here we are, you know, we're dealing with purgatory and you touch on the idea that, you know, yeah, it's seen as a Catholic perspective as opposed to one that Martin Luther and the Protestants had some problems with mm -hmm. Tetzel and, mm -hmm. and indulgences and, and tying together purgatory with raising stipends. Did you ever hear anybody say, well, it seems like you're kind of trying to buy people out of purgatory like you're buying your way into heaven? No, um, I, I connected. What, what is it that the souls need most What's the most efficacious way to help the souls in, in, you know, in purgatory? And of course, in the catechism of the church and you know, all the way back to the beginning of you know, uh, Peter praying for the souls, mm -hmm. um, praying for the dead, Maccabeus, um, it's, it's they need the body and blood of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And it's the highest, it's the summit of our faith. It's the highest act of worship. It's the highest form of prayer. And that's what they need. Mm -hmm. So um, I really didn't have any trouble, you right. know, trying to put those two together. People were picked up right away. Well, great. Okay. Now, part one, you go into what do we know about purgatory and the holy souls? Because we, we hear a lot of different things. But here's a great quote, and I remember hearing this before by Archbishop Fulton Sheen, who says, as we enter heaven, we will see them, so many of them coming towards us and thanking us. We will ask who they are, and they will say, a poor soul you prayed for in purgatory. That's really a powerful image, isn't it? It's very powerful. Um, you know, Doug, we are part of the communion of saints, okay? Um, when we're baptized, you know, we are you know, incorporated into the body and, you know, into the, into the communion of saints where Jesus is the, is the head of the body. Um, so we're, we're called the church militant, mm -hmm. and um, we're out there Though fighting. we don't hear that too much anymore. No, uh, we don't. Thought, oh, this is sound, this sound like we're fighting with everybody. Right, well, we're fighting the good fight, fighting, you right. know. Um, we're, we're standing to, up for the truth. Right, right? and right. getting souls to heaven, right. and get our family me members to heaven. And then there's the um, church suffering, the souls in purgatory, mm -hmm. um, who are helpless and need our help. And then we have, uh, you know, the saints in heaven, the church triumphant. So what's interesting is nothing is done alone. The church militant reaches out to the church suffering and enjoins them with the church triumphant. It, we, it's together. We're, we're not alone in this. We work as a team. What I thought was really nice uh, for, for the average person picking up this book in this whole first section, you kind of really take on the kind of standard questions the average person like myself would have. What is purgatory? You quote the catechism. Uh, where is purgatory located? And you use uh, in his general audience on August 4th, 1999. Blessed Pope John Paul II stressed that the term purgatory does not indicate a place, but rather a condition, quote unquote, of existence of those who after death exist in a state of purification. Yes, uh, it's, his, it's an outstanding definition. He doesn't say punishment, Doug, he says purification. Mm -hmm. And so what's this purification? Um, we're, we're, you know, who can say you're perfect and ready to go to heaven? You know, who can say that, you know, uh, and how, you know, what is it? How do you, you know, how do you reach heaven directly? And basically, Mother Angelica spoke about it, the great saints, is doing God's will in all things. Right, and you quote several of the saints in yes. the book to kind of give an idea of their perspective. Exactly. Right? But if you're not perfectly lined up with God's will, um, if you're so, you know, um, there's, a, there's a quote in scripture by Habakkuk, and it says, his eyes are too pure to behold evil. Mm -hmm. And so are we totally pure? He's totally pure, he's all majestic, he's all holy. Mm -hmm. Can we say we're ready to stand and enter heaven? Um, so purgatory is the masterpiece of mm -hmm. God's mercy. He, he's saying to us, you know, yes, you know, we, we have faults. I don't, he, he knows we're probably not gonna be able to line up perfectly. And he gives us this wonderful masterpiece of his love and of his mercy mm -hmm. to be able to be purified. So what's the purification? The purification is um, we're being purified by his love. Mm -hmm. He's purifying our hearts. He's purifying us with his attributes, Doug. He's purifying us with his love, his mercy, his justice, his truth. That's the work of purgatory. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now you also say, this is another question, why does purgatory exist? You say the church is clear that purgatory exists as a gracious gift of God's love, a masterpiece of his supreme mercy. Because a lot of people would say, well, why do I have to go through this other step? You know, if I've got the grace, why can't I just go to heaven? 
it's a loving purgatory. Um, uh, 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 some of uh, your EW10 priests give great examples. You know, you know, if if you're invited to a wedding um, and you just got off work, and you know, my brothers were in, in, in were plumbers. Mm -hmm. You know, and you know, I remember what they looked like when they came home. Would they be prepared to to go to a wedding? No, they would say, "We'll go I'm, see the king." We'll go right, see the king, king right? The I'm not ready. I have to get ready. Mm -hmm. um, and our Lord gives us this chance to cleanse, you know, to purify our hearts um, with these remnants that were left right. over, anything that we were clinging to. Right, and they're the holy souls. Why are they yes. called holy souls? Good question. Most you got the most common asked questions I get. They're called holy because they can no longer sin. Mm -hmm. Okay. And okay. Okay. They can no longer sin, and they also know that um, they're saved, mm -hmm. and they know that it's just a matter of time before they reach heaven. Right. A lot of people, you know, growing up had different impressions of what it was like uh, in being in purgatory, and you had, you took the question, what do the holy souls suffer? And a lot of us had different ideas from being like it's an ante room of hell mm -hmm. to being an ante room in a sense of heaven. And you say purgatory is not the inferno we may have imagined as a child where souls are surrounded by flames of fire. Their suffering is one of longing and unease for their separation from God. They see him and know him but are not fully united with him. Right. What do they suffer? The, um, the, the major pain, the primary pain, Doug, is the loss of the sight of God. Once the soul leaves the body and sees God and sees Him in all His glory and all His beauty and all His infinite and the love that the, that He you know that that God had has for Him, um, and not and knowing instinctively, you know they choose whether they they can they feel it instinctively whether they belong there, um, and they feel if they don't belong there um, they they go they mm -hmm. go to purgatory and what they experience in purgatory is the loss of that sight um, and they cry out god god i must be with god it's a spiritual fever it's i call it a heart sickness for mm -hmm. god it's a hunger for god it's a thirst for god it's a drought it's a famine um, that's the prayer of purgatory. Okay, so now we get the idea of maybe why this makes sense and how mm -hmm. it is. Then you ask the question, which is which you talked about earlier, if purgatory is simply purification, how can a third party intervene? What what can I do? What can what efficacy do my prayers have for, let's say, relatives of mine who might have passed, who may happen to be in purgatory? Mm -hmm. How as, can I help them? Right, as I said, we're all connected. So after death, it doesn't mean you know out of sight, out of mind. We're still part of that um, that that communion of saints. And uh, the most efficacious way, the most powerful way, the number one way uh, is is the mass, the mm -hmm. sacrifice of the mass. It, it either will relieve them or release them. Um, and alongside the mass is the rosary. Mm -hmm. uh, I call them the four pillars, Doug. The mass is, is the number one. Alongside the mass is, is the rosary. Um, and why? Because of the indulgences attached to the rosary. Uh, I, these works are done not just to, to share and explain, but to say, here are the means to get your loved ones out of purgatory, to, re, to relieve or release them. Alongside the, um, uh, the rosary is the way of the cross. And we, we covered those books here on your show in the past. Right. Why the way of the cross? The indulgences attached to them. Mm -hmm. um, the way of the cross, a uh, fascinating um, story about the way of the cross for the souls uh, I, I had read about. There was a, um, a nun in a mother house and there was a, a bishop visiting. And so at the end of the evening, she was closing, you know, locking the doors, checking things to make sure things were in order um, before she retired for the night. She, she came to the chapel and in the chapel, she heard this rustling sound and she looked down the aisle and there was the bishop on his knees praying the way of the cross. Mm -hmm. And it just took her by surprise, and so she backed off and left the lights on. And the next day, um, she shared with the nuns what she saw and how touched she was, not knowing that this was going to be John Paul II, Blessed really? John Paul II. Okay. So he was a man of simple piety. He was a man that knew hardship. 
he, he knew the hardships of his people, and he summed it up in praying the way of the cross, uh, you know, right. united those sufferings with, uh, with our Lord. He prayed the way of the cross every Friday, whether it was either a prayer mm -hmm. book or in a chapel um, throughout his life as a priest. Right, and you talk about near the end of part one, you say, you kind of say, what's the best way we can help the holy souls reach heaven? And, and you basically have a litany, but it all basically has to do with prayer. Now, you mentioned and you talk about the idea that we all know that the Holy Mass is the highest act of worship and the highest form of prayer. Sometimes people don't think of it that way, mm -hmm. but it is. Now, there's the Novus Ordo, which most of us go to, and then there's the Tridentine Mass that some people like and go to. There's also something called here the Gregorian oh, Mass. Oh, yes. So, mm -hmm. what is a Gregorian Mass and what does it have to do with the Holy Spirit? I, I just, uh, I, I light up when you, in fact, we've got Pope St. Gregory on the front of the book. Pope St. Gregory was an incredible Pope. He was the first monk to be Pope. He was the first to be called great. He was, he gave us the Gregorian Masses. In fact, he gave us um, uh, our, our, our God bless you. When we sneeze, he was the one that, that gave us God bless you. Um, he also kind of officially formulated the church, giving alms to, the, to people. Mm -hmm. And last but not least, um, he gave us the main devotion for the souls in purgatory, Gregorian masses. They're named after him uh, because uh, he was a Benedictine monk and uh, he was uh, a sickly pope. I, I would say because of the fasting and the the austerity of his life. He, he was in intense prayer. Our Lord had visited him many times. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the monks named Justice in the monastery was sick. And actually Justice was his physician. Uh, so, but Justice was ailing and he was dying. And so um, after uh, uh, Justice died, he um, ordered uh, the monks to have 30 masses offered for his soul. Mm -hmm. Well, why 30, Doug? Why not 40? Why not 50? What was, what was significant about 30? 30 brings you back to the Old Testament where the Israelites honored their dead for 30 days. Okay. Moses, Aaron, Jacob. It, he was bringing back the tradition of praying for the dead for 30 days. So 30 masses were offered for justice's soul. After the 30th mass, Doug, justice appears to his brother um, and said that it was released from purgatory. Through a private revelation, um, uh, Gregory already mm -hmm. knew. And uh, from that point on, the people of Rome heard about it, the people across the ocean heard about it, and they were converging on the uh -huh. monastery to have these masses offered. Now, the $64,000 question is, is, is it guaranteed? Uh, you know, after 30 mm -hmm. masses that a soul will be released from purgatory. The church doesn't guarantee Right. that it, it's going to be released, but it goes back again. They're pointing to the efficacy of the, right. of the mass. Right, right, and I would Put think, those in your will. That's right, what and, I and we have up what. on the screen the uh, web address if people want to find out more information about how they can uh, uh, have Gregorian masses said, et cetera, right? Uh, spiritualtreasury.com right, is, yes. is actually the website. And also I was thinking with all of the thing, with the prayer and everything, because here's a line that says, are my prayers wasted if the soul's already in heaven? But I think about, <laughs> and how much of what we're doing here is really for us too? Oh, when right? we when we help the souls and when when, when we give, not in souls give alms, we're having mercy on ourselves mm -hmm. because Doug, when we go to heaven, it's not going to be about us. It's going to be about what did we do for others throughout life. That's how we're going to be judged by our actions and by you know what we did from our hearts, not by the accomplishments of my books. It's how did I help my neighbor? You know, did I you know my neighbor? Um, you know, anybody that was put in my path, how did I respond to the graces um, that God gave me? And actually, it's those responses, Doug, that's going to determine how much right. purgatory, you know, right. I have to do. And you're talking about mercy, and in part two, you talk about what the saints reveal about purgatory, and one of the stories about St. Faustina, of course, uh, one night she was visited by the soul of fellow religious who had recently passed away, and you talk about before the soul left, she urged St. Faustina to, to not to cease praying for the souls in purgatory. Whenever possible, St. Faustina would pray for the release of the Holy Souls in purgatory. In the vision of purgatory, Sister Faustina asked the Holy Souls what their greatest suffering is. In one voice, they answered that it is their longing for God. There is that primary, right. the primary loss is, is they long for God. In fact, Faustina, our Lord allowed Faustina to mm -hmm. experience that longing for Holy Communion. Mm -hmm. 
and she had she said she had this great longing it just it was just so intense she thought she was going to die and our lord said he allowed her to experience that longing for holy communion to know what the souls in purgatory um, were experiencing as well if i could just just sidetrack a little bit we were talking about uh, you know, how do you help the holy souls? And what if uh, the souls are already in heaven? Right, exactly. What do right. you do? You know, and the common answer. Yeah, are my prayers wasted? Yes, are your prayers wasted? Um, no prayer is ever wasted. In fact, um, Mother Angelica talked about this once in all the shows I've ever watched called, a term called accidental glory. If a soul is, okay, right. if, if a soul is already in heaven and you continue to pray for them, the common answer is, our Lord will distribute to souls that need it, or our Lord will distribute to souls in our family. It's greater than that. Our Lord's generosity is, we can never measure up to his generosity. Thomas Aquinas says it's called accidental glory. The soul, if it's already in heaven, gets two things. It gets an intimacy, um, a, a greater intimacy with God, and it gets an increase in its intercessory power. So the lesson, Doug, is, is mm. never stop praying for the souls in purgatory, right. no matter how long they've been. Um, right, because these days, and you kind of talk about it uh, in the book, you know, sometimes the way it is today, A, nobody goes to hell, and certainly everybody who dies goes to heaven, and so people... We canonize everybody. Right, exactly. We canonize, uh, if you've been to Wakes, you know, they've suffered enough, uh, you know, I, I, they, they, they did their purgatory and they went straight to heaven. Right. We can't judge the state right. of the soul, only God can judge... So there is an aspect of purgation or purgatory in a sense in this life, right? Oh, absolutely. Too, you right? can, you know, um, you can avoid purgatory, you know, in this life, ba ba number one ways is just doing God's will in all things, which right. is not always the easiest. Right, right. Uh, St. Catherine of Genoa, the apostle of purgatory, I know Father Groeschel likes her, her perspective on purgatory, and mm -hmm. he's spoken about it on the network. This was an aspect I wasn't aware of. St. Catherine tells us that the souls retain no knowledge of why they are in purgatory. At their judgment, they see why they are going to purgatory, but never again while they are there. It, I explain it in detail, but I, I won't be able to tell you off the top right. of my head. It has to do with charity. Uh, it would, it, um, but she, yeah, there's only once right. that you see, and then after that, you're, um, you're paying off a debt. Right. The other one that struck me was Padre Pio talking about the holy souls. On page 70 and 71, you talk about him. I see many souls from purgatory, they don't frighten me anymore. And there's a whole story here about uh, uh, that supposedly deceased soldiers during World War II would line up for his intercession. And in one case, a monk who lived with him spotted strange soldiers near the friary's fireplace wondering how they got in. Padre P explained that they were not actual soldiers, but departed spirits would stop by for help on their way to the hereafter. They, they stop by for help. They also stop by to thank him. Um, and it's at that same lesson that we should always pray for the deceased, no matter, you know, they were soldiers. I don't know how many, you know, which, which war was it? It could have been. Yeah, World you, War II, they mentioned been, in that story. Exactly, least, years ago. Right? There's something too about Padre Pio that just, that just stuck out. Um, uh, and we, we put it in the book that had to do with, you know, um, what happens if I pray, someone had died already and I didn't pray, but I'm praying for them now. Mm -hmm. He answered that just most eloquently. You and I both die, and through, he's talking about himself, that if he died, and a doctor he was referring to both die, and through the good fortune and the goodness and mercy of the Lord, we're obliged to stay in purgatory for a hundred years. During these years, nobody prays for us or has a mass offered for our souls. The hundred years pass and somebody thinks of Padre Pio and has masses offered. What is so awesome is that our Lord, in the, the past doesn't exist, the future does not exist. Everything is an eternal present. Those prayers had already been taken into account so that even now I can pray for the happy death of my great grandfather. There's no bureaucracy with our Lord. Doug, <laughs> I, I, I even did that myself. I had a grandfather. He was hit by a cab. I'm not sure where these cab things come in our you family. You guys got to pay a little more attention we, crossing the street we, apparently yeah, here. He was hit uh. by a cab. They, they couldn't find him. He died in the hospital. And I was fortunate I had the papers. And so I decided what I was holding Padre Pew to his word. I says, well, there's no time with God. I got up, the, you know, this was 50 years ago plus. I got up at the moment that he died. We had the hour of, of his death. And I said, Lord, there's no time with you. I'm going to pray this chaplet of mercy for his soul. Um, and um, so I did it. And then I offered Gregorian masses. Then I went off to um, New York. Father Groeschel was going to be there. Mm -hmm. And um, I got on the plane. And there was a man sitting next to me. Um, and he, as we took off, 
he got up and took out um, a, an instrument. Mm -hmm. And my, my grandfather uh, played the mandolin. He pulled out the mandolin, mm -hmm. and he started playing the mandolin. And he was playing Vivaldi on the mandolin. And, I, and this was just after I finished. And I looked at him, and I just took that as a sign, as mm -hmm. a gift, saying, I know what you're doing, and I'm okay. Mm -hmm. And I shared it with the musician. Actually, he ended up, it's a, there's a mandolin um, orchestra in right. New York. And he said, take that as a sign, which I did. Those right. little reminders are little gifts of grace that we get. Right, uh, and just before we go, how long did it actually take you to put this particular book together? This book, Doug, seven years. Seven years. Seven years, um, and it took a year uh, to write. It's, uh, it's, it's, it, I was able and to- And when do you write? I write, um, during, every day during the week, I, I treat it as, as a job from okay. nine to five every day. The weekends, if you right. take off, you have to you give yourself a break. Right. You need time to uh, let your head clear. Another book in the works? Oh, yes, yeah. On this theme or yes. off of this theme? We're, we're, we're mining purgatory mm -hmm. deeper. We're taking it to another, another level. We're going to be doing the writings of John Paul. We're going to be doing Thomas Aquinas, Catherine Genoa more on Gertrude the Great, um, special prayers right. for the souls. It'll be uh, a prayer book that we're Right, and this is out. a good primer for that because a lot of that, you talk, touch on some of that right, in exactly. this book as right. a, a leading. Well, thank you so much, oh, Doug, Susan, it's been a for pleasure. the wonderful book. Thank you oh, for joining us on our new set here on EWTN's Bookmark. And speaking here with Susan DeSoni, author of Praying with the Saints for the Holy Souls in Purgatory, published by our Sunday Visitor, available through the EWTN religious catalog. Check it out and check us out next time right here on EWTN's Book Block. Thanks for joining us.